What's up, guys? I am your host, Connor Lane. Excited to be joining you for another episode of the Half Step Pod. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, I shared the team with him at Stanford for one year, his fifth year, when he won an NCAA championship in the 5K, my freshman year. Uh, he's been a pro runner at Bowerman since the summer of 2018. Uh, he is my roommate, Brandon McGordy's older brother, Sean McGordy. We're excited to have him on. He's had an incredible start to the 2022 track season, running 13.06 in the 5K at BU, 27.18 in the 10K at those two races where Grant set American records at. So remaining a little bit under the radar, but knocking off world qualifying standards. Uh, he's certainly excited for the second half of his outdoor season. What we get into in this episode is flashing back to, to a year ago to his uh, time at the Olympic trials in the steeplechase, including you know, the highlight or low light, or at least, you know, exciting part of losing his shoe for, for the prelim and having to put it back on in the middle of the prelim and still qualifying for the final. Uh, and then the ensuing adversity that Sean faced after that period of time where he had to get surgery on his Achilles. Uh, he's no stranger to surgeries and running injuries. So we get to open up a lot about his journey through some of those and how he's been able to bounce back, including uh, a scary foot infection that he had in 2019. So Sean and I get into it for a little over 80 minutes. It was an awesome episode. We talked a lot about dealing with injuries, uh, those struggles, uh, his progressions back and how he's been able to kind of get back to running at a super high level uh, and, and who he, who and what he credits all of that to. So excited for you guys to listen to this one. It should be really good. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. We'll catch you later this week, I think, uh, on the House Step Pod. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the House Step Pod. I am your host, Connor Lane, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, BTC athlete Sean McGordy. Sean, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm I'm happy to uh, to finally make it on the pod. You know, had to wait till season two, but happy to uh, be doing this with you. Hey, we we tried to make this thing happen multiple times. I I will certainly take responsibility for not not connecting at the end of it, but it just you know it never fell on the right never fell on the right day on the calendar. It seemed like a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving pieces. We're two busy people, you know, it, uh, it took exactly. a little bit, you know, I think, you know, Grant had some uh, other BTC guests. He was a little more fond of, I guess, you know, going with Elise right before me. I mean, I'm, I'm a little hurt, but I, you know, I'll recover. That was unreal shade. Yeah. To have Elise on just, just before you, but we knew we had to get you on, uh, especially with the season you've been having and the, and the, and the kind of comeback that you've had over the last year, which is really indicative of like, kind of a theme of your overall running career of, of comebacks and, and working through a lot of different adversity that's been thrown your way. We're going to be sure to touch on all of that in this interview. Um, yeah, I almost don't even know where to start. Really, really broadly, big picture, you're training right now in Portland. Uh, you're coming off of a couple of really fast races, getting the, getting the world standard in the five and the world standard in the 10 at, at these meets, at the BU indoor meet, and then at the 10 presented by Sound Running. Um, just before we kind of get into the, the backstory and, and why this is so incredible, in my opinion, uh, talk to me a little bit big picture about hitting these marks in kind of the first half of your outdoor season before we get into kind of championship season. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, those two races and kind of hitting the world standard for both of those races was, you know, kind of the big goal, big focus, ideal um, scenario uh, with the indoor slash outdoor season. I know the 10K was technically technically outdoor. Um, but yeah, Jerry, you know, I think has just always preached, um, you know, once, well, once you hit those standards, you have a lot of flexibility with the types of races you can do and types of training you can do. And so that was just a big goal because once we had those out of the way, then he really has a lot of flexibility to design training in the best way he sees fit. So it was really important to be able to, to knock those out. So it was super pumped. Um, and that just meant a lot being able to, you know, accomplish both those goals after, um, you know, coming off of surgery in the summer. And um, yeah, right now we're, it feels like we're back in fall training with the, uh, just the style and types of workouts we're doing right now, kind of just a revamp of the strength. And, um, you know, he likes to talk about building silos of all the strength. And so we're building another silo. Um, and yeah, I think we're maybe two to two and a half weeks, three weeks away from going back up to altitude. And That'll be the uh, fun stuff again, and then we'll get to do some more racing uh, beginning in May and then heading through the rest of the summer. So, yeah, just kind of 
a little bit of back to basics right now, but uh, it's it's definitely still fun. And it just, you know, it feels a little better than it did in the fall because there's just a little more fitness than uh, than there was at that time for me. That's awesome. That's what Grant was saying, too, about this feeling a little bit like base training, like fall training. Seems like that's kind of a buzzword topic right now within the team. And yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely got me thinking kind of, are you, is it weird to be doing that kind of base training this close to, I guess, this part of the championship season, kind of regressing after such a fast start to the indoor season? I mean, I think the first week was kind of an adjustment. And, you know, I still think um, there are days where you kind of like miss the speed day um or specific type workouts but i think we really know there's a purpose to what we're doing um and i just think it's a great reset for the body you know after the 10k we kind of had a down week um where we weren't really uh working out at all and i think it's just a nice way to get back into the swing of things and kind of reset the body and um you know the workouts are plenty you know they have their own different challenges they hit a little different than you know a specific workout but it doesn't mean it's not hard so um yeah, it's been a, uh, a great combo, and I think it's been – overall, you know, I've been enjoying it. And, um, yeah, so it's been good. Yeah, I'm excited. We'll talk more at the end of the pod kind of about about the future weeks and what's in store for you. But uh, taking it back, you mentioned your surgery uh, earlier on in this podcast. I think a really cool place to start is in the is in trials buildup in 2021. You know, the, the COVID year happens kind of for everyone. It kind of delayed your initial transition – maybe into this new event that you'd been discovering since you joined Bowerman, um, joining a guy like Evan Jager, uh, you're always going to get, you know, being a tall athletic dude like you are, and maybe with yeah. more of a, well, maybe at the time, what we thought was more of a 3K, like expertise, potentially, there was a lot of talk about you starting out in the steeplechase. And you made that transition, I feel like in, in late 2020, maybe, but really kind of turned it on and did it in some races in 2021 seemingly in preparation for the Olympic trials. So before we talk about your kind of journey to the trials, that experience and then the aftermath, talk to me about the initial decision to, to start the steeplechase. And was it yours? Was it Jerry's? And where did that kind of come from? Um, I'd say definitely started with Jerry. Um, it actually started all the way back in 2018 um, when I f- had my first conversation with Jerry at uh, Starbucks in Palo Alto before Peyton Jordan. Um, you know, I'm super nervous is the first time I'm talking to Jerry. I'm, you know, want to talk to him about potentially joining the team. And, um, it was a great convo. We were talking for like a few hours. And one of the things he mentioned is that he kind of believes everyone has like their ideal distance. And, uh, for some people it could be the 3k. And if you're going to do the 3k, um, you know, at the international level, it's going to be the steeplechase. And he kind of just mentioned that it was something he would potentially want to explore in the future um but it wasn't like set in stone that it would maybe be what i did but he was definitely open to the idea so it started then um in 2019 we started doing you know some steeple drills we actually did a few workouts and i was actually gonna race my first steeple back in 2019 Mm -hmm. um things got sidelined a little there with um an infection and a few surgeries later um it was clear i would not be running the steeple in 2019 but um you know then we thought maybe 2020 we're back to doing drills back to doing a few workouts and then uh the pandemic happened so we were not on any tracks where we were going to be able to do a steeple so you know our team as i'm sure you and grant have talked about did you know that huge series of inner squad races um was a lot of fun and then i kind of did a steeple boot camp for two weeks after stayed back with jerry and pascal and um, after doing one week of just workouts, did a, a 2K time trial and then a 3K time trial um, on the Nike track um, since it has, you know, it's set up that we could steeple. And then, yeah, I think after that time trial, they felt good about it. I felt good about it as something that we, you know, kind of want to see what it would look like in the 2021 season. And yeah, didn't do any workouts until we were up at altitude in 2021, but the plan was always to race um at mount sac like i did and kind of get a feel for it and see if it was something we wanted to do at the trials because we'd gotten the 5k standard so you know it's all about uh having options with jerry for sure you never want to box yourself into a corner whether it's with race scheduling or with with what event you might do at the trials i we honestly you brought up a lot there first of all 
some of those interest squad meets during the the fall of 2020 included you running a 13 11 5k and winning one of them uh hit, hitting the world standard so definitely not too shabby and not going to let you out of here without at least <laughs> talking about kind of how that was a big breakthrough for you but really you brought up something that i didn't know if it was in the timeline to talk about but we totally totally should which was the the very scary kind of infection at was it the end of 2019 middle end of 2019 yeah um things kind of yeah went awry in june but it kind of stretched all the way into september so which is a rough rough sequence you were getting surgery for the achilles right or was um, it um i don't really a, i think um so. all these years later i think i've realized now um before we went to altitude camp that year i had gotten a rash which i thought was poison ivy um and so really didn't think too much of it but um you know it was it was where a lot of my like lymph nodes are and so i was like a little confused but it went away didn't think anything of it and then um yeah i don't know if i just maybe i'd had a blister in like the spring before we went up to camp that year or, or something down on my foot or maybe there was just more blood in my feet just from you know just the normal stress of running but i i, I don't really think um, there was something just lingering in my body for, for two years from the previous surgery back in 2017 for my Achilles. So it did happen to be on the same foot and like in a similar area, but, um, you know, I just think it maybe just happened to be a weaker spot on my body that the, uh, infection, I guess thought was a good place to, uh, post up. So, um, yeah, well, more, that, more broadly, uh, more broadly yeah. explaining kind of what happened for someone who, who doesn't know the story and doesn't know maybe as much about your journey, mm -hmm. like, like what exactly went down and how serious was it? Um, I think I let it get more serious than it needed to be. I think it could have been, you know, but I don't think anyone's first thought was really like, oh, this is an infection, but, um, we were up in park city, um, workouts were going well was excited to race was excited to make my steeple debut um there's a lot of things to be excited about and we we did a speed workout on tuesday and you know that evening i was like oh like my heel feels a little sore like that's weird i haven't really felt that um since like 2017 when i had a, a stress fracture in my calcaneus and i was like oh like should probably monitor that and the next day on Wednesday, I did my morning run. Didn't feel like amazing, but I tried icing it some. And then I went to double that day. And I remember, I think I did half a mile and the pain was just excruciatingly sharp. And I was like, I can't run. I was like, I think I have like a stress reaction or stress fracture in my heel, which seemed like totally out of the blue, really random. Um, and so like, I was icing it when we were, as we were like trying to schedule an MRI to kind of see like what was going on in the area. And uh, what gradually started to happen is there started to be a little more swelling. Uh, the area started to get like a little red. Um, but the first MRI came back and, and didn't really say anything about the cacaneus too much. It said there was some edema in like my talus, just some of the other bones in the area. In fact, like we thought, if anything, I might have a stress reaction like in my uh like talus or in my ankle joint or something like that but mm -hmm. nothing was too concerning with the heel itself um and then um you know but it still it felt terrible to walk and just gradually started to get a little more swollen started to um i started to get more red i started to begin to have like night sweats um and like not good just, things not good it's signs. not i can tell you it was miserable um like i was starting i don't know if i ever like i probably had a fever but i would have like pretty bad chills and um yeah i mean my foot just started to like really just started to swell up and it got honestly it got to the point where i couldn't even like walk or put on a shoe um because i just couldn't like get my foot out of like an angle where it's just kind of like hanging like loose <sighs> Um, and so we went to urgent care. They're like, okay, like we think there's an, well, we don't think we know there's an infection. They sent me to the ER. Um, and I started getting an IV twice a day to, um, with antibiotics to try and help the infection. But after I think three days of that, um, Elise was talking to Shalane and 
she was like, I think you need to go to a bigger hospital than the Park City Hospital. So we drove, Elise and I drove down to the University of Utah Hospital. Still remember because it was the same day of pre in 2019. So we were watching the meet in the in the ER uh, at the University of Utah Hospital. And um, they pretty quickly were like, okay, we need to do a CT scan. And they're like, yeah, there's an infection like in your foot. We need to do surgery. So I stayed in the ECU that night and had surgery the next morning, July 1st. Um, that was definitely a whirlwind. Um, just to like have gone in and then finding out you needed to have surgery. And somewhere in, in that night, I had an MRI. And it's still, I think, one of the more painful experiences of my entire life. Because just with how much swelling and everything going on, I like couldn't put my foot at a 90 degree angle. And um, that's the angle you need to have your foot in for, for the MRI. So it's basically just 30 minutes of like, basically like legit, like crying. Um, oh, and like, man. just asking like every single minute, like how much longer do we have? Like how much longer? So did you like, hold it anyway? Or did they like try to prop it with something? Um, I had to, it kind of slid in and <sighs> the guy offered me morphine at one point. I was like, okay, I'm not doing that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I was, cause oh, I was God. just, I mean, it was excruciating and, um, had the first surgery in, in Utah and kind of thought things were, were better. Um, you know, I was definitely like, definitely irritated that this was like happening and, you know, dealing with the infectious disease doctors. I think like, I kind of more just wanted to fix this as quick as possible. And so we opted only to do um, pills for the uh, antibiotics, like moving forward. Like I would just take an antibiotic um, as a pill for like two weeks and they thought that would be enough. But uh, while some of the swelling went away in my ankle, it never like fully went back to the same size. And when I started to run again um, in August, I was still kind of struggling with, with swelling and like pitting, like just a lot of like inflammation in the area. And um, I went home in September and my, <laughs> it's, my foot just swelled up again. And mm -hmm. um my uh my parents made the executive decision that i needed to go back to the er so um we went back to the er and they're like yeah the infection's still there and it's actually in your bone um oh god so i had surgery the next night um and it's actually pretty i seem to have a thing of going to the hospital on like important days for my team because the first one was pre and the second one was uh when lopez uh mo and woody all ran and Centro all ran the 5K at the Nike track. Mm. And so I remember sitting there in the, the ER and Brandon's like, oh, dude, what he just broke 13? Um, <laughs> so uh, there's something about the timing of these things. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I had the, had the first surgery um, the next night. And they, um, I basically, I think I ended up being in the hospital for like a week. Um, ended up doing two different surgeries just to make sure the area was totally clear. And they had to take some like, bone samples and cultures just like find out what the actual infection was and to see if it was in the bone and um i also then before i left the hospital was given a pick line this time no more uh, oral antibiotics they're going straight iv so they they put a pick line this. like into my right arm and i think it was 40 centimeters long just to kind of get as close to your heart as possible and um when they do that you're just kind of laying there and they like have you under an x-ray machine so they can kind of track where the the line is in your body um and so then i would have to administer oral or iv antibiotics every single day for six weeks um and had the pick line in for six weeks and that um thankfully was the end of it but that was a a very long un uh, unexpected uh hurdle to uh come back from <laughs> Pun intended for yeah. the steeple jokes, but yeah. you, you start, you start, I mean, that is a wild experience and somehow, well, maybe being the most severe, most scary, or at least one of, um, of your surgeries or like injury issues, just because of how random it seemed and how sudden and how like unknown a lot of those quantities seemed. It also like, you've had, you've had a go of it with multiple things kind of of that nature, maybe not infectious yeah. disease oriented, but certainly with mm -hmm. surgeries with different you know blocks and running and you, you you come back from uh from this foot surgery uh to to remove the infectious disease and, and you're back running and training and 
you know, a year later, we're out here running 13.11 in the 5K, which in itself could be a whole podcast just on that journey. But simply because of what's happened since then, you know, you go to come comeback. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, a, there's always a new comeback, it seems like as well. So we do that. And, <laughs> and now, yeah, you're, you're finally back preparing. You've got this new event that you planned to do <laughs> before all this stuff went down initially. Um, and, and you do at Mount Sac, you hit, you hit the trial standard and f- my notes are not right in front of me, but you also hit the world standard in that race, right? Yeah, um, I was able to. Yeah. What did you run? Was it eight? Uh, eight twenty. Yeah. 20. Yeah. Which was under it. And you know, you, you won that race. I remember, I mean, obviously I was talking to Brandon, which for those who don't know, Brandon McGordy, Sean's younger brother is my roommate and has been for the last few years. Um, he's in my grade at Stanford. And so I was talking to him about that and hitting the world standard was, was so huge because it knocks that out before the trials. I remember reading articles about Sean McGordy, steeplechase is his event. He's like, <laughs> he's popped onto the scene. Evan was coming back from injury at the time. Right. So talk to me mm-hmm. about, I guess you've probably been asked this a hundred different ways by a hundred different people, but getting to run with someone like Evan, who really, at least in the modern day is like the all time great in an American steeplechase, um, like learning under him and then kind of opening up, you know, anticipating the trials in a similar way to him. Like, talk to me about kind of that experience and what it was like running with him and then maybe more cumulatively with Bowerman joining the team uh, as being that younger guy when you came in. Yeah, I mean, that was like Evan just from, you know, my time in college was always someone I was just watching and was definitely someone I looked up to. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think everyone on Bowerman was. I still remember when I first uh, – went up to St. Moritz in Switzerland for the team with the team for like five days. Um, when I went to Europe in 2018 and, um, I forget to Randy Wilbur, uh, someone that works with like the USOC, like he dropped me off and he's like, Oh, your roommates are going to be Evan Jager and like Ryan Hill. And, you know, he just says it super casually. And like, in my mind, I'm like, what? Like, Whoa. Um, and you know, just, these because they were just guys that I'd followed for so long and had looked up to and what they were able to accomplish. So, you know, that in itself was surreal, but, um, you know, it, it, I don't think you can learn from anyone better than Evan in the steeplechase, no, especially, sure. um, in American distance running. And, you know, he's, he's been one of the best in the world. Um, but it was, you know, he had to do a lot of the help, unfortunately through, uh, through more like advice and talking me through it, we actually were only able to ever do one steeple workout together from the time I joined the team to racing at the trials. Um, Just with some of the things going on with his body. And then when some of the things were going on with my body, things just, (laughs) just, you know, they didn't always line up. Um, But he was just huge from, you know, um, just teaching me the basics perspective and kind of talking through like his experience and, you know, we, uh, we worked out together, I think it was right before Mount Sac. And that was when he decided he'd be in a spot where he could help rabbit me and to have him rabbit the race through 2k was, was huge. It was a very calming feeling being able to warm up with a teammate, um, and helped, you know, not make everything I was doing so foreign and so new. And just to, um, you know, have someone that's had a lot of success in the event, believe in you was also just really encouraging for me. Um, and so after that first race, unfortunately, his, his calf got to the point where he wasn't going to be able to continue for that season. But, you know, he stayed longer. He might have, he definitely stayed a few days longer, if not like a week longer, just so he could make it and watch my last steeple workout, like before the trials, because he just wanted to, you know, be there to, you know, give pointers, encourage me and just be there to support me. And then, I mean, that really just speaks to the type of person he is. Um, but that was really cool. And it definitely felt very fortunate and very lucky to, um, have had that experience heading into the trials and, you know, his own experience for how he started doing the steeple in 2012, um, right before the Olympic trials and then winning and making the team was, was also something that was a big source of inspiration. Cause, you know, I do think there were some nerves with it being a new event, you know, finding my uh my footing and what I was like confident in and if I was fully confident in the event and with hurdling and everything like that so it definitely always helped having uh, him as like you know a sounding wall and being able to talk things through him it's awesome to hear that story uh you know Evan seems like an incredible teammate and it's indicative of so many 
of the themes I feel like we see with Bowerman over the last few years, um, since I've been paying closer attention, what with like you and Grant and Thomas joining the team, is just these tremendous kind of like pace jobs in races, just like the selfless nature of it and how that's mm-hmm. not, not limited just to the races, like hearing about him staying up there or giving the extra pointers. It's, it's, you know, it, it almost brings that like collegiate vibe of like how much you care about your teammates yeah. to into that next level. It's, yeah. it's awesome. It's awesome. Fast forwarding a bit now at the Olympic trials, right? This is your second, ste- third, second steeple in the prelim, right? Or is it your third? Uh, third. Workouts, we, but third. Yeah. Third. We ended up going to a Portland Track Oregon. Festival. It wasn't yeah. like an amazing race by any points. I was kind of, you know, five minutes before that race, I was like, oh, I don't actually know if I'm going to race. I was kind of dealing with something in my right foot. Just a pointer in general, if you're debating five minutes before a race, if you're going to race, <laughs> probably not probably not a good sign with where your head's at. Oh, um, man. But yeah, it was it was still a good experience because it was a different type of race compared to Mount Sac. And I think I ran like 822 with that one. And, and that was a good experience yeah. of like what someone like Mason and Bernard Keeter were going to be able to do over the last few laps because they were able to pull away from me then. And, and that was a really eye opening experience. And, you know, I'm definitely glad I had that before the trials. Um so, but yeah, then we, we get to the trials and that would be my, uh, third steeple. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I remember watching the second one. Now we were over just across the, the field outside of me, uh, last spring. Uh, I, I watched that one with Brandon as well. And we remembered thinking like, okay, he's, he's going to be in this thing, uh, at the trials with a legitimate shot, even on what was kind of an off day for you. I, I, I'd a hundred percent agree with what you're saying, by the way. Like if you're, if you're thinking five minutes before the race about <laughs> some aspect of your body, it might you might be in a little bit too deep in terms i mean maybe sometimes it has worked for some people i know in my experience and my peers experience oftentimes that is not a good sign that things are about to go like super well yeah. and are and are worth pushing through for that extra little bit of running but mm-hmm. to each person their own of course i know you've dealt with a lot of kind of pain or soreness during racing during training mm-hmm. probably have found your own pattern to work with there but that that yeah. might be a little bit extreme it depends on the situation for sure <laughs> but Fast forwarding into the Olympic trials. This is the thing that I was just Googling around uh, just to refresh myself so I knew exactly what the situation was. But I saw a Washington Post article featuring you after this prelim. A, a ton of a ton of news write-ups written about it. This was a big deal, Sean. <laughs> um, and probably not for the reason that you you wanted. Uh, well, ultimately qualifying for the final is the reason that you want. But definitely not in the way you would have expected either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about a thousand meters into your prelim race, things are going well. You're, you're kind of, I, I forget if you're on the outside or at the front, but you're, you're, you're in like a solid position. You're right where you need to be. Um, the trials were top five auto cues. And then what was it next? Like four time cues. I think it might've been next four. Thankfully. 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 I think it was next four. <laughs> about a thousand meters into your trials race, you get flat tired, you know, just, just, in the nature of the steeple people running up on each other all the time right over clearing Mm -hmm. a hurdle and uh honestly you should probably take it from here on what you decide to do (laughs) the situation the the i want to hear about like the nuts and bolts of it but i also and i'm sure maybe it didn't enter your head during the situation but this being the olympic trials kind of the pinnacle of you're trying to make an olympic team you know going into this meet you're certainly a top three candidate uh some sort of dark horse because you're maybe such a rookie to the event but certainly everyone's saying sean mcgordy has got a shot he's got a shot and we're in the prelim which is supposed to, you know it's difficult but it's relatively smooth sailing and you get flat tired in the middle of it you make a decision to stop and put back on the shoe rather than flick it off so talk to me about that and then also just talk to me about like was there panic like what are you thinking and then the rest of that race which was a mad scramble to, to catch back up Oh, I mean, I definitely, definitely said in that it was the Olympic trial. So don't worry. That thought, that, that thought came <laughs> into my head. Um, yeah, we were, I think it might've been the, let me see, second water jump. Um, and just like you said, the nature of the steeple, you know, it wasn't an absurdly fast pace. So we weren't strung out and just unfortunately, uh, you know, one of the runners behind me just literally, I looked at the spike mark after, I don't even know how he was able to, it got a part of my shoe because it is so close to the edge, but yeah, just nicked my shoe enough that as I brought my foot out, the heel came clean out and um, you know, immediately you can tell and you're just like, did this seriously just happen to me? Um, And I mean, it's, you know, your mind's kind of moving like, 
a mile, like not a mile a minute, like 10,000 miles a minute. Like you're just jumping from <laughs> one thought to the next, like, and you know, the first thought was, do I flick it off? But, um, you know, I've talked to people and heard enough stories that when you flick off a shoe and you keep running, the track can be pretty brutal to your barefoot. And I was like, if I'm going to race again after this, I think I need to have a spike on. And, you know, I just kind of want to take, I don't want to just jeopardize the the state of my feet. So um, I was like, okay, like I need to keep the shoe on. Like, can I just keep kind of jamming my foot into it? Um, and I, I cleared one hurdle barrier and I was like, okay, like it's kind of all right. But like, I really am like having to like really stay focused on not letting my shoe came off. And as I kind of, headed to the next barrier. I was like, okay, like, I think I'm going to need to stop. And so, um, hurdled the barrier right across the finish line and then did the one right on the, uh, right before 300 to go, which coincidentally, uh, left me is, basically right? right in front of, uh, yeah, the Bowerman yeah. fan base and yeah. my family. <laughs> and I just, you know, very casually just go wide into lane five or something like that, wow. kneel down and as uh, controlled as possible, start trying to aggressively pull my shoe back onto my heel. Um, you know, it took a little bit longer than I thought, which definitely started to increase the uh, the panic a little. But I yeah. remember I, I got it, I got it back on, and I just I looked up and I was like, oh wow, they are farther ahead than I thought they were going to be. So, um, but from that moment on, no thinking. It was just you know what you need to do, and you need to to run as hard as you can to 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 catch up, but not like you don't need to do it all at once. Um, you know, I won't lie. It definitely helped knowing I had also qualified in the 5k that, uh, that there was potential for, for, for that race in case this didn't go well. But in some ways, you know, I really think that was my best steepling of, of the entire trials experience because it really was kind of what my whole experience with the steeple had been so far was me running by myself finding a rhythm and not having to worry about anyone else around me. I still think that was one of the things that took me a little bit to, to adjust to was being comfortable hurtling and racing with a lot of people around you. Um, just with all my workouts, besides one being solo, I really didn't have a ton of experience with that. And I think it was something I was still a bit uneasy with. Um, but you know, in this situation, when the whole field's ahead of you, don't have to worry about that. And, uh, Thankfully, I was able to find a good stride and just try to just get a little closer, a little closer each lap and was able to work back to the uh, the final time qualifier, um, which then proceeded to give me a nice 20 to 30 minutes of, of watching the uh, second heat to see how things were going to play out there. Thankfully, uh, things played out well and um, I was able to slide on to the final. You, you did, you mentioned not trying to get it all back at once when something traumatic like that happens. And I feel like mm -hmm. that is so important, such a professional mindset, right? I feel like there's a tendency of like to immediately flip out, lose control and, and rush closing that gap and then maybe closing it successfully, but burning out everything, all the hope you'd have of like mm -hmm. kicking it in at the end of the heat. I felt like I remember watching that and you doing a really good job of just kind of metering yourself slowly back up through the field. And then you know, that finish, like it was all that you had, it seemed like to be able to squeeze into ninth in your heat, which, you know, at the time you did not know what the second heat was going to run and did not yeah. know if that time was going to stand up. So how did you feel crossing the line? Uh, like, were you, I mean, I'm sure it's just, yeah, you can't believe that that happened. It was a wild experience. Are you thinking already about, okay, I've got the 5k or like, well, did you know ninth was last? Like, I knew, Where were you I think at? I knew nine was last time Q. Cause I think I was doing math in my head. Um, I think I was really, I think I finished fairly close to seven and eight, where it's like, oh, like if you could just have gotten like a little more, you'd feel a little more secure. No one likes being the last little tiny cue. Um, but the, the heat was relatively honest and quick. I think, you know, I was ninth and might have run like 825, I think. That's so fast. yeah, I felt pretty, like, I think we felt pretty good about that. Um, you know, I think I saw a picture after the race of my, cheeks like completely full of air like just making a face where it's like like did that like oof, like man that really happened um so i think you're kind of just like trying to take it in but like you said there's still another heat so you're kind of you know there's a chance and that's when it's kind of like the waiting game and and nbc comes up and they're like oh like do you mind like watching with us live and i was like 
well, I got to watch anyway, so I might as well watch with you guys. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And, and for that, like, you never really know when, until it's over. But, but thankfully, after a few laps, I was like, okay, it looks like it's going a little slower than ours. Mm-hmm. And probably with like 1,200, 800 to go, I was like, okay, I think I feel good that six people, you know, won't beat the time that I was able to run. And yeah, I think, you know, you're, you're kind of just on like, sensory overload like that was just like way more stimulating like a race in itself is already like something that gets all your adrenaline going and then just to have that happen that just is so like unexpected and in like at this point the biggest race of like my life i was just like geez so that was uh it was a whirlwind but uh thankfully i landed on my feet after it <laughs> and and you're through to the final right um and and at the end of the day you you, you sit back and it's like all right i still have this opportunity in the trials final top three going to the olympic games i have the standard um talk to me about that race because we still have we still have a whole lot to get through even just in this episode right about yeah. like what happened afterwards about and i know that this race the trials final was a little disappointing but there was a lot of stuff kind of going on or maybe you were starting to feel with your body obviously yeah. not in the form of excuses right for, mm-hmm. for what like yeah. for the performances or anything but talk to me about kind of that trials race where your body was at and then the aftermath of it yeah so so going back to that um race in portland portland track festival that we did the second steeple um cooling down for that race was the first time that i can like remember really feeling like the left achilles like i went to cool down and i was like this hurts every step that's new i was like that that used to not be there um and so you know i was working with our team pt i felt like we'd gotten it under control like things had maybe been like a little sore occasionally, or I was being smart with like, um, you know, anti-inflammatories just like help things like stay calm. Um, and you know, didn't feel it at all in the prelim, but the next day, uh, I go to run with, uh, my other brother, Ryan, and my dad was going to be on the bike. And I mean, from the get go, like it just did not feel good at all. Um, on the left side with my Achilles and we're like a mile in and, I'm like really not talkative because as I'm sure everyone knows when they don't feel good on a run, no one really feels like talking. And I like apologize. Like Ryan, I'm like, sorry. Like I can't really like focus on conversation. My Achilles like does not feel good at all. And my dad's like, yeah, I could tell like just from biking behind and like seeing like, you know, when you're doing like kind of like the little gimp Mm -hmm. walk, (laughs) gimp run. Yeah. Um, Or you're just limping kind of like through your run. And um yeah, so we we called the run short. The original plan was to run like 50 minutes. But we're like, I can't. Like, we need to just call it. So we flipped. And I think only basically hobbled through like 25 minutes. And you know, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little stressed um, at that point. But my dad was like, okay, maybe you can bike some or like walk on the treadmill. But he's like, honestly, like you don't need to really do anything. And um, I don't know if I mentioned it to Jerry at that point because at that point I was like, I can't really do much. Um, you know, just tried to take some like Advil or a leave and just hope that like tomorrow would be a little better. And, and it was a little better the next day I was able to get through, um, 50 minutes. I felt like it like gradually got better through the run. Um, I felt like I was maybe running normal, I guess no one was with me on that run. So no, one, I guess I don't know if no I was running tell. normal, yeah. but I told myself I was running normal <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, cause then the next day was pre-meet. So, um, you know, we did pre-meet and, again like a little better than the next day it's still there and I I think more than anything it was definitely hard to to not have on your mind um but just try to just believe that things would be good and ready for the final and um you know I, I can honestly say like standing on the starting line at the final I was not thinking of my Achilles um I think you know it was a lot to handle the few days in between but on the start line, it was not a thought in my mind that it would be something that would like limit me. Um, but yeah, in, in the race itself, um, yeah, really just, I felt like I did not perform, uh, up to the level I was capable of. And, you know, I think I say that knowing that that doesn't mean I would have made the team at all. I just think like on the day I was, I was not the best version of myself and, I think my mind got in the way of that. Um, you know, I remember pretty early on, um, 400 or 800 in just not feeling relaxed, kind of looking at the clock and seeing the time. And then, you know, 
thinking like, oh, why does this pace feel this hard? Like this shouldn't feel this like hard. And then just with like, as the race progressed, um, you know, it's, it's to me, it's never been a good sign if my mind is active while I'm running. Um, if I'm thinking too much, if I'm like really like thinking about how my body is feeling or where I'm at, um, you know, I'm, I'm typically in my better races. It's much more of a, uh, you know, that flow state, like there might be some thoughts, but it's like in and out, you're not really focused on like any particular thing. And um, yeah, I think with maybe a K to go uh, or 1200 to go, things started to pick up a little. I remember there was a big water jump where like, felt like five people went around me and I was just like, geez. And yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely not a fun feeling uh, when you feel like you're just like watching the dream kind of uh, get away from you and, and, you know, I'll use a pun, run away from you. And, you know, I think that doesn't help because then I think you're like, you're thinking about that when you don't really need to be thinking about that. You should just be thinking about racing and, um, you know, finish the race. And I think uh, a quote that I had ironically heard and had kind of put as like uh, a motivating quote for the for the month was doubt kills more feel fear or I botched that doubt kills more. uh more goal or more dreams than failure ever will. And, um, I definitely felt like the doubt that I let creep into my mind in that race played a role in me not running up to my best, which is just pretty hard to not feel like you performed, you know, where your fitness was or what you were capable of, um, you know, in your biggest moment. And I think just the prelim and the, the final were kind of just a tale of two races and a tale of how, you know, in the prelim, I didn't let any doubt, play a role it was just pure confidence that like okay you can make this gap and I was able to get a time qualifier whereas in the final I think you know doubt had its way with me um and you know that was that was hard um I think it helps when you're a part of such a great team and there's a lot of other high moments um like I think you know it it helps um not just you shouldn't just that way I wasn't just like sitting with what was going on with me um but then honestly, like, I think then I kind of knew that I needed to address the Achilles. So that also then kind of limited like, okay, you didn't make the Olympics, but maybe you can go do some racing in Europe and try and run fast. But um, it became pretty clear after that race that the Achilles was something I was going to need to figure out. Well, oof. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, of sorry, stuff. I just uh, I think I just rambled no. there for a bit. But no, I mean, oh, you even know because we almost I almost came on the podcast after the trials. But even I don't yeah. think I was like in the spot yeah. where I was like, oh, like talking through all that stuff was still like hard. I just think sometimes it can take a little bit of time to like fully process, you know, and reflect. And obviously, it's not fun to be like, oh, like I got in my own way of performing at my best. So for yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, we we texted after the trials, and I remembered wanting to get you on because, like, truthfully, because like a big reason why I started the podcast with Grant was to, to highlight the highs and the lows of professional running. This dude just kept like winning everything, and we were like, no, okay, he doesn't make it. He doesn't make it easy, you know. He no, just, no, I'm it's like, like, it's just he just keeps yeah, going up and up and up and up and up. <laughs> Unreal, twenty six thirty three. I just, but but what I will say is like when we talked about it, you were kind of willing to, but at the same time, it felt like maybe you didn't have the full understanding or full picture of what was going on, which part of what part of it was fixing the Achilles, which you'd find out later. And I don't, I don't want to sit here and make excuses for like you or your races, mm -hmm. because that's something that's between you and yourself in a lot of ways. But I would imagine that the mental toll of within the trials race, the immediate aftermath of it, like with, Achilles pain like I've had Achilles tendonitis still kind of have it in my left Achilles and it's like like that is such an unfun feeling it's such mm -hmm. like it feels like you're getting flat tired every step in a way yeah. and for that to kind of come on to you a few days before what's going to be the biggest race of your life and to have such a by no you know like the opposite of a relaxing prelim there's a lot of mental energy there that is just going to be used no matter how tough you are and I wonder yeah. if you would reflect on that and be like May, like, all that stuff kind of takes little chunks out of you so that maybe when you're on the start line, you're not quite as like buffeted against any of the adversity you face yeah. um, as you otherwise would be. I don't know if that's something you would feel or agree with, but 
I mean, that's hard because you yeah. are a really mentally strong guy and are usually able to maximize what you can do. Yeah. With. I mean, I definitely think it can chip away. Like you said, like, I think it'd be naive um, for me to say that it didn't impact me some. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't think I would truly let myself like, let that be the only reason though. Cause I just you don't think, yeah. you know, I just don't think that's, that's fair um, to, any of the guys that, that made the team because they freaking ran great and brought it. And I think like, you know, there's been times where I have been great mentally, but I think there's also been times where I haven't. And, you know, there's a lot that can go into that, but I just think, unfortunately, uh, when I needed it, it was, it was not one of the times um, that I was great mentally. And yeah, I, you know, I do think, that stuff does play a part, but yeah, I think it was also just a, uh, a good wake up call of like, okay, like, you know, there have been some moments where you're not running up to the fitness you're probably capable of, like what is, um, you know, what is limiting you or what's getting in your way. And, and, you know, that was something that I continued to honestly reflect on for, for a while. And then, you know, finally took action on later, later in the fall slash winter. Yeah, and I don't know if you're directly referring to the Achilles situation, if there was some mental stuff that you also worked on. But yeah. talk to me about, I guess, this this aftermath. And you end up not racing in Europe. You end up, you know, trying to solve the Achilles. What is the procedure? And you're something you're you're not unfamiliar with by any stretch, right? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. So the uh, the first two days after the trial, just like didn't run because I was like, I don't think I can um that's a good reason I mean, and uh yeah. yeah i think i just lost my lighting um you still look good yeah. still look good God, thanks um <laughs> but yeah so we um didn't run those few days i ran like on monday of like the following week and was like maybe i can work out on tuesday but i did the warm-up and i was like I think I did like a few strides and like, I think each one got slower and like it felt <laughs> worse. And I was like, okay, like I think this Achilles needs like a few more days. So that was like on a Tuesday. I think I took off the rest of like the week until Saturday maybe and started to run then. And, um, you know, it like gradually was getting better. I was like only running in the afternoon. I started with just like 35 minute runs for two days and like, then 45 then like 50 and it was like I think it's the type of thing where I kept like telling myself it was getting better and like telling myself it was like okay when like objectively I don't know if it got any better during that time time span at all and uh ended up working out that Friday and did mile repeats but like was just it didn't feel like it felt probably the best while I was doing the mile repeats, but I went to cool down. And I was like, I can barely like move. I was like, this hurts like really bad. And, um, cause we debated getting an ultrasound right after the trials. We're like, Oh, like if I can keep running, I was like, maybe I don't need it. Um, but after that workout, I was like, okay, like I need to figure out what's going on. Um, and so we, the next week we, we got an ultrasound and uh, at first he was looking at something on my right foot because that had just been kind of something that was like a lingering thing. And I kind of just wanted to know what was going on. And, you know, that one was different. He's kind of talking me through the whole thing, what I'm looking at, like what's going on. And then he goes to do the uh, left Achilles and he's just like quiet, just like he's not saying anything as he's like looking at everything. I'm like, OK, that's not great. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then he goes like, oh, so you have Haglins on your left Achilles. Um which is something and, you know about. Yeah, which is something I know about. Had the surgery um, for Haglund's on my right Achilles back in 2017. So as soon as he says that, I'm like, I was like, okay, I guess I, I was like, I need, in my mind immediately, I was like, I need to get surgery. And, you know, because at first we're kind of taught, he's like, you know, it says there's tearing in the Achilles, the bursas, bursa sac, super inflamed, like, it's just like literally just bringing back all these conversations from uh, 2017 and um, we're talking through and he's like, you know, you could try and like just treat it with like PT and stuff, but he's like, I really just don't think it's going to go away. Like I think surgery might be the best option. And I was like, well, like, you know, I, I do have some experience with that. And um, quite ironically, the doctor he was going to recommend was the doctor I already had in my head that I was going to go to. It was the same guy, Dr. Hunt, uh, right? Dr. Kenneth Hunt. Yeah. That did my surgery in, um, 
2017 out in Colorado. And, and so when he said that, I was like, oh, well, clearly we, we both know who's the best. Um, so, but yeah, that was definitely a shock. Like if anything, I think I had, I mean, half-heartedly joked at the least, like if anything was really bad, I thought it was going to be like what had been bothering me in my right foot. I was not expecting to hear that about my Achilles, but, um, funny. I mean, I don't know if it's funny, but I call my dad after my mom and dad and I'm talking to them. And as soon as I tell him like his haggling, my dad's like, Oh yeah. He's like, I figured when I saw you running, uh, the day after the prelims, he was like, the way you were running just reminded me of how the run started to go in like 2016, 2017. And I was like, Oh, sick. Um, so yeah, but then it was like a whirlwind, like, as soon as like by the time I'd driven back to my house, like I called Dr. Hunt, but he didn't answer, but I shot him a text and he's like, I can talk to you like later today. Once I'm off work, he calls me, um, kind of give him the rundown. We also got an x-ray after the ultrasound and you could see the, uh, nice little, uh, claw like thing in my heel, um, mm -hmm. where the Haglins was. And I kind of run him through the situation. He's like, yeah, like, absolutely. I can do your surgery um like i'll have the scheduler reach out like tomorrow and because immediately when i knew i was going to have surgery i was like i'm trying to do this like as quickly as possible um and so i didn't hear from his sur like his scheduler like right away in the morning so i texted him um and i was like oh like i haven't heard yet like is there any ch like just kind of reminded him like i'm ready to go like i said on the phone i was like i'll fly out and do surgery on friday but he's like okay you can't do that um but he sent me like i think he was thinking near the end of july and i was like oh like is there any way we could do it before then he's like he took a little bit to get back to me or maybe not even that long but obviously when you're like waiting every minute, every minute feels like an hour like year, yeah and he's like oh like i think i could squeeze you in like on wednesday of next week he's like could you get out here in time and i was like absolutely um, and that was like on a Thursday. So I joke, I mean, it's no NBA or NFL schedule where they get surgery the next day, but a week turnaround is pretty good for, uh, for me. And that's the closest I think I'm going to get to a, uh, that level of status. So, um, funny enough, Ryan is flying out to visit me, um, spend some time with me in Oregon just cause everyone's still at camp. He lands on Thursday and I'm like, Oh, so we're going to Colorado on Monday. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so he thought he was going to get a, a, a trip in Oregon ended up being a combo of Oregon and Colorado. And yeah, okay. I had surgery on, um, I think it was the 20th or 21st. Um, either way, it was almost like four years to the day or no four years in one month, uh, from when I had like the other one. And so, yeah, I had surgery on the left Achilles um, for Haglins. And, and what they do in that surgery is um, he does it uh, arthroscopically. So I just have two small incisions down um, near the insertion of my Achilles. And he uh, cleans up the uh, torn part of the tendon. So he just takes out all the pieces that are frayed, whatever percentage that is. Um, I think mine might have been like 30%. I'm not totally sure. I think both of them were 30%. And he removes the uh, inflamed bursa sac. He shaves down the calcaneus so it's no longer rubbing um, and causing tearing of the Achilles. And then uh, he also did some like, he said he kind of equated it to dry needling where he pokes like super tiny holes in the tendon just to like promote blood flow in the area. Um, and so got that done. Um, you know, woke up, the splint was on and uh, it was time to recover. And it's, it's not a short recovery. I think that's another big reason why you sometimes feel the pressure to start and get the surgery in as quickly as possible. Cause you're looking at a timeline that feels like a long ways, right? Yeah. And so getting it as quickly as possible is helpful. So for people who don't know about Haglund's, how long is that recovery typically? Um, and kind of how long you immobilized? Yeah. So it, it can kind of vary. And honestly, it had improved from, um, the timeline I had back in 2017. Um, this time I was, I was in the splint non weight bearing for a week. And then I had post-op, um, or I followed up with, with Dr. Hunt after a week and we switched into a boot, but we were still non weight bearing. Um, like we're still on crutches fully spent a lot of time on the couch with my foot elevated. Um, but once the, once I'd gone into the boot, um, 
I was able to like start doing some like ankle mobility where it's just more like literally it was just about like ankle circles, ankle pumps, like moving my toes, like just getting the foot moving again, trying to just like uh, help the blood flow, get out the inflammation and, and things like that. And then um, at two weeks, um, I switched to being able to walk in the boot, but that was kind of a gradual process where like maybe like the first day was kind of on crutch like you gradually kind of loaded it um while on crutches and i spent a whole week in the walking boot and then this time after th- at three weeks i was able to take off the boot and start walking um and this was definitely much quicker than um the first time around the first time yeah, around right. i was non-weight bearing for two weeks I was in a walking boot for two weeks and then walked around without a boot for two weeks before i was allowed to hop on the alter g this time i think i got on the alter g around like five weeks um but you know started at like 60 percent, definitely easy running building into it um and yeah i think i worked with um you know our team tt colleen little and and we really she did a great job of, of building me up because um you know, you want to just do everything as quickly as possible. And I think there were times where I felt like, um, you know, I was like, Oh, I feel like we could do like a little more maybe, but she really, she did a great job of, of building me up. Um, cautious or just, she really had a smart progression, but it was also like actually a quicker progression when I look back than I actually realized. Um, but I actually ended up spending five weeks on the alter G and kind of different than the first time I had the surgery is, Colleen's approach was to try and build up the total amount of running um, more than just how quickly can we get you to running on the ground. And I feel like that, that works well. A lot of uh, there's a lot of cross training and biking in, uh, in that time frame, And there's just different ways that we were also beginning to reload the tendon, but I think it was kind of a, you know, it was definitely a, a build back where you're kind of managing pain or, discomfort and kind of like deciding like what's appropriate i think you know the calcaneus obviously goes through through some stress with it being shaved down so i think there's just still some like edema scar tissue and and things in the area so there's a lot of different pieces that you have to uh try and stay on top of and it's also you have to be smart with what you increase because there are definitely some times where i think i would make things a little angry and uh it uh, the area definitely lets you know (laughs) Yeah. And that might be chilling out for a little bit after a couple of days or maybe not even, but just like being smart and touching the (laughs) upper bound without overflowing it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's honestly like a way nicer recovery than I feel like your first one. And, uh, but I mean, it's gotta be a scary experience having, uh, having to go back under the knife for Mm -hmm. for Haglund. You, you, you don't start running on the ground then until what, until like October, maybe. I think it had been two and a half months. Um, I think so surgery could have been late September. It was late September. I was in Colorado and it was like right before I went home. Um, and I think, yeah, cause it was like the last week of September. Um, I think I went for like, I was allowed to do like one 10 minute. I ran for like 10 minutes, had a walk in between, did another 10 minute stint with a walk in between and then had like a five minute run so i got to like 25 minutes total i think for the first run um and um yeah that was the that was the first time on the ground yeah and then from there i mean we're talking about february of this past year early february running uh 1308 right at Mm -hmm. at or 1309 at bu so you know i i it just, it just feels like such a quick turnaround, right? You have like a solid fall camp, but you've missed a couple months here. And then yeah. you kind of pop out at the end of that ready to race at altitude or coming down from altitude with everybody. Um, tell me, I guess, quickly about that progression and then kind of like what what you were thinking going into that meet if you knew that you were, yeah. hey, I'm still in sub 13 10 shape for the five or if you really <laughs> knew that you had that <laughs> or where, where you thought you might be. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, so basically, I think, you know, it's it's interesting. Like we've kind of talked about, not that, um, you know, I'm happy this has been the case, but have had some experience coming back from, from surgeries on my feet. And, 
each time has been a little different and kind of like the way I've approached the build back has been a little different this time. Um, just with kind of what was going to be available for me from a cross training standpoint, definitely like biking. I just like quickly realized was going to be the way I was basically going to do all of my cross training. And I kind of structured the biking as if it was like a typical running week or a typical like cherry week. And, um, you know, he counts all of our mileage at seven minute pace. So I was like, okay, like take the total number of minutes you bike, divide it by seven and see what your mileage was for the week. And so that was kind of like a way that I gradually built up my cross training. And that was a way, like when I started to add in the alter G with the, the biking, I was like, okay, what's your total minutes of exercise? And the goal was to get that to what my typical level of training was. Um, honestly like ended up doing like a little more total minutes of exercise than my typical training which i think caught up to me a little um but yeah so september was when i first started to run on the ground and the guys were going to start working out um near the end of october and so that was kind of like a big goal of like okay can i start working out when they are and fortunately i didn't i didn't do hills that week but i did do something on the track that week um but the fall was man the fall just felt like every every workout was just like going to war. Um, Cause you know, you're, you're with guys that are fresh off the Olympics. Um, they just absolutely crushed it. They're building on fitness. You know, they didn't really lose any fitness, whereas you're kind of clawing your way back into things. Um, but, you know, j just fought for, you know, each workout, but I think things definitely caught up in December. Um, I just think, the, the load on the Achilles at that point had caught up. Like there's definitely a lot of balancing of the types of workouts we were doing and just how things were being stressed in addition to like some of the leg lifting I was doing. And I remember there was like one week where maybe I did both workouts, but I had to take a day off or like maybe a few, I don't know if I had to take more than one day off in between because like my Achilles, like I was just like, it's like, it needs a break. And then the next week, I missed a workout because something was irritating me in my foot. And then like the week after that, I had to stop the workout early because something else. And it was just like, I was like, Oh, December, this just like does not feel like the type of training. Like I normally do, or it's not the type of training that I'm like feeling super confident with. Um, and we, this was all kind of right before we went home for like, you know, I, I say winter break as if I'm still in college, but uh kind of for christmas um in the holidays like right before we go up to winter altitude and that was kind of like a reset for me um i decided i was like the running is the most important thing you need to stop doing some of the biking you need to just cut out the leg lift right now like let yourself just run and feel good with that and then you can kind of build from there and that was when i first got back up to the level of mileage that i like to train at that's when started to feel like I was getting a little more momentum with workouts. And so those two weeks at home were, were huge. I feel like that was just a huge reset for me and had me feeling more confident going up to camp. Um, and then camp, I would say it was definitely like where I was able to just start feeling a little more like myself. And, um, you know, the workouts were still really hard, um, but I was able to do more and was like, you know, finishing with, like grant and mark on some of them and i'm like okay like i think you're in like a pretty good spot and we knew the 5k was coming up in february and you know i was definitely i thought i could um get the standard i think i was a little naive with how it was going to feel because i hadn't run a 5k in almost a year um but thankfully was able to uh to grind through that and um yeah walk away with with the world standard which was just a huge i think like you know, that, that day was that weekend was just so unique for the team where just like everyone kind of accomplished their goal. Um, and I just think I was that I just really appreciated. Um, I was like, OK, like, you know, it was a really a grind to get back here. But I think it was just like a moment where in the past, maybe I haven't always been as good at this, but where you kind of like let yourself like appreciate what you were able to accomplish um, and put everything into context. Um, which, which I think was a good feeling and then definitely kind of set the stage uh, to keep building. Yeah, I mean, so you go out there and run 1309, which hits the standard. Is the standard 1313 or 1311? 
13, 13, 5. Point five. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you knock out that standard with a whole bunch of your teammates. Obviously, Grant runs the AR. Or, oh, yeah, smashes the AR. Like, Moe's running the Canadian record. Mark. Yeah, everyone. 3 yeah, 13. I, I think we said, like, the team had, like, six national records. It was like, geez. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's got to be an awesome thing to be a part of. And then just a couple of weeks later, you come out here and debut in the tent. I mean, besides cross country, this is a debut for you. And I... I should say a couple things. First of all, it felt like your 5K performance kind of went under the radar. It felt like, you know, which I, I feel like is exactly kind of where you want to be in a sense, right? Uh, it's, it's, but, hey, I will say when your teammate runs 12.53, it's understandable <laughs> that uh, yeah. that gets the headlines. <laughs> but at the same time, right, you're, you're ticking off the boxes in a very similar way. You know, you, you get the world standard, you move into the 10, it's your debut event, but it's also not super talked about. And you go out in the 10 and you, I mean, at least in my opinion, smash that run 27, 18, hit the standard as well. But again, it gets kind of swallowed up in Grant and Mo running like sub 26, 40, just like ridiculous times there. But this is, this is your debut 10K. Um, you're not going out with the, that top pace that's going to go break 26, 40, 26, 45, whatever mm-hmm. it ends up being you are on a pace to hit the world standard and kind of check that box. So talk to me about the decision to run the 10 and then also, I guess, goals for that race and and then how it felt and and kind of executing it as well as you did. Yeah, it was, uh, well, we almost, I almost ran the 10 K last year. Um, We ended up opting for pacing um, with kind of like the option to stay in. And I took the guys through AK and I kind of had like, just it wasn't like anything really major but just something kind of like had been nagging me a little with my hip and since I felt it I was like okay we have a 5k in two weeks like you should probably just like step off but um you knew you weren't going on a 10k at trials too right we probably knew knew we weren't going to um at that point but I think Jared was like you know we could have you do this like I think it would be good to see like what could happen or just to have the time but we kind of opted like that the five we were just going to focus on the 5k um but this year we definitely knew that we wanted to to try and get the world standard in the 10k like i said he loves having options and as an athlete i love having options too um and so we uh we knew that that was kind of like the goal and so after the 5k kind of you know recentered refocused on like okay this is what we're we're aiming for um like can you knock out the world standard and kind of it was great just to race again just kind of get re uh, reacquainted with the grind and the hurt that uh, that can be the 5k and can be racing sometimes. And, um, you know, just from that experience, I think I was definitely excited, um, but definitely I think better than the 5k I had an like understanding or like a better like expectation or is better, better mentally preparing myself for like how it could feel in the race. Um but yeah, like we, like you said, there's kind of two races uh, within each other um, in that in that first seed, and just tried to find a good rhythm um, in our pack. Kind of just honestly got out a little further back than I would have liked, but gradually mm-hmm. um, kind of just moved up and uh, found myself like you know in the lead of our group with like 1,200 to go, and and then in, I think his name's maybe Jack. I don't know if it's Jack Ryan. I feel like that is a TV show, but um an australian runner he uh he took off with like 1100 or or 1k to go um but you know then i was just kind of just in my rhythm gradually squeezing down and yeah i was super pleased to get the time i feel like i felt that was the first time i kind of felt like myself running and racing in like probably over a year um like that feeling just just crossing the line and accomplishing that i was like okay like that feels good like you're I think more so than the 5k honestly that one was like all right like what you're doing is working like you can see the momentum like this is this is good um and so that was a special feeling and it's also just special just to like see your teammates do these incredible things and like be a part of that um so you know the post-race hugs are just you know they're great these days um are they are they content too are are those posts of of all the lightning bolts stand on i mean i've got i've got pictures back from grant's freshman year of him and i giving each other some great 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 post-race hugs at ncaa so it's been a a, collage it's been a it's been a consistent theme um but uh but yeah that one it definitely 
you know, was something we wanted to hit. And I think Jerry and I both felt like good about knocking or checking that box. And I think I felt good about, you know, finishing that chunk of the season and being able to accomplish those two goals. Cause, cause honestly in December, when we kind of had talked about that being the plan, it felt like, you know, I, I think we both thought I could do it, but I think it felt a little uncertain just with like how the month of December had gone and you just never kind of know how you're going to respond and things like that. I hadn't worn spikes up to that point. So there's, there's just a few like uncertainties and steps that remained in training that I like felt like I was really going to need to add in to make that happen. And thankfully I was able to do that in Flagstaff. Well, I think the big reason why like I'm excited about the next potential couple months for you, why people are excited about it, you know, flying under the radar, but still starting to get a little bit of buzz around you is kind of because of what you're saying. Like, the 5K didn't, I mean, maybe nothing feels good and everything is painful when you're running this fast <laughs> to an extent, but the 5K definitely, I know what you're talking about, like felt like a grindy kind of like opener race and you're still able to break 13 tenths, still able to hit the world standard. Um, you come back into 10 and maybe you're feeling a little bit more like yourself and pop off like this, this fast time, this 27, 18. Um, it, it's got to give you a lot of confidence. The, the, the speed with which you've been able to come back from these roadblocks with each ensuing kind of piece of adversity, like seemingly able to tackle it a little bit smoother, a little bit cleaner, you know, gaining mm-hmm. some sort of lessons from it and moving now to a position of like, you're fit, you're healthy, you've, you've run these times and yeah. it really seems like there's a lot of opportunity here in the next few months for you. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, definitely exciting. I think, um, you know, I think as you're building back, I think what's nice is sometimes it can be easier than normal training to feel like you can see progress like week to week. Mm -hmm. um but yeah i think you know fortunately like fitness cumulatively builds like even if it was like a little bit you know felt i felt far removed from it or or rusty like the training that had gone in from you know the fall of 2020 to like the spring of 2021 that doesn't all like disappear like your body still did that it kind of remembers that it just takes a little bit to get back to that and you know i like you said i think each each time you learn new things and you know i think a big thing also was um and I kind of mentioned this earlier, like reflecting on the mental side of things was I actually decided to start working with like a sports psych um, in the new year. And I think that definitely made a difference and helped those performances happen. Um, I think it, it played a major role of just kind of embracing, like being the best you can from like all you know, not just the physical side, but the mental side. And like, how can you approach this to try and just be the best you can be? Um, And I just feel like that change also has, has definitely made a difference. And I'm definitely, you know, regardless of what happens the rest of this season or moving forward, I think the lessons I learned and like the experience of like going all in on yourself and like, um, you know, being honest with yourself and then kind of like addressing the things that need to be addressed, like has been incredibly helpful. So that's been a great experience as well. And I think definitely played a part in these two races. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. It seems like a really quality tool for you. It's yeah. I also, I use our Stanford sports psych here and I've kind of found a similar, similar progression where it's, it certainly can help you work through, you know, a lot of stuff or really unlock maybe the most out of yourself. If you have a good relationship with the person. Um, Yeah. To clear up a couple things, or really just one thing, Jack Rayner was uh, Jack Rayner. All right, so I was close. Who, who got away from you? Really close. I mean, there's an R, there's a Y, there's an A. Yeah. You know, the whole the whole name is in there. Yeah, yeah. He got away from you in it, um, but you finished fourth in the ten um, in the same race where Grant smashes the AR and Mo once again smashes the Canadian. And yeah. it feels I got like some pretty fast that. teammates. You know, yeah, and, uh, they're, they're, it they're, uh, it helps to be. I mean, and I would say that as far as the comeback, I felt the same way at Stanford. Um, you know, every time I've come back, I've had Grant to try and chase. Um, but like similar at Stanford, definitely here being surrounded by excellence makes it is extremely motivating and it's just it's fun to be around. And I definitely think it helps bring out the best in yourself. So very, feel very fortunate, um, you know, to be surrounded by the guys that I am, because I think, you know, I don't think it any of it happens Um or maybe happens as quickly um, without them. Well, look, I mean, you're, you're a really driven individual. I think every single member of your family has met them all. <laughs> I, I would, I would certainly say that, but yeah, I mean, Grant and I talk a lot about, 
we talk about it in the context of races, but also lifestyle about like making as few decisions as possible because you've kind of already made them or you put yourself kind of in a situation where you're going to follow, like you're going to be doing what you can or maximizing or, or doing whatever you can. Like we talk about it in races a lot of like you make a decision to be in a pack and that you're not going to drop before a certain point. You're going to do everything you can to stay in it. And that way you're not in the pack going through the really rough part of a race. Like maybe I yeah. should drop, like you're still going to have the negative thoughts, but you've, you've made this decision and you're going to stick to it as much as you can until you like blow up or drop, or maybe you do hang in there or whatever. And it feels like yeah. that same philosophy kind of multiplied out to represent a team and a lifestyle is kind of what's going on at Bowerman right now, where it's like, if you put yourself in the workout group with these guys every single time, there's not much deciding about like whether or not you're going to try to go be elite today, you know? And then really, really, it seems to be like listening to your body, which is something that you've seemingly gotten a lot better at. um, Or maybe it took a, I know it took a little bit. No, it was, (laughs) uh, was, I was talking to my dad and he's like, Oh yeah. He's like, I feel like you're actually getting better this year at listening to your body. Cause it, yeah. 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 Sometimes it's about cutting that workout like a rep short or, or skipping a day even or, or doing whatever the deal is. Cause you know, in the long run, that's going to preserve yourself. It certainly takes mm-hmm. a lot of lived experience to get there though. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But no, just, can... just, to, just to cap it, like it, it seems like putting yourself in that environment will lead to good things and the best possible outcomes for you. Cause you certainly do have fast teammates, but you're a fast teammate among them as well. Right. Oh, we got, I appreciate it. So, yeah. We got two big Q's, two A standards going into trials. I, I don't know if this is a, I mean, it seems like the 10 K the month before the actual Olympic trials, the 10 K trial, seems like that's going to be a likely hit for you. I don't know if we're able to confirm that on this pod or not though. We'll see what happens. I mean, I think, I think that's where things are heading. You know, Jerry, you know, I, you know, we don't show our cards, but I, I think, I think it's an event that I'm excited to see what, what could be there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, after that first race. And I think, um, you know, we're continuing to kind of, balance the Achilles and decide what we think is best. And I don't want the door to be closed on the steeple, but I also don't know if it makes sense to try and do where we're at kind of in the season. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be something I continue to talk with Jerry, you know, we're going up to altitude in a little bit. So uh, yeah, nothing, nothing set in stone, but I mean, I'd love another tech, uh, another, uh, crack at the 10 K. So we'll see, uh, we'll see if I'm lining up in May. I mean, I think I, there's a pretty good chance I'll be lining up in May. Yeah. You got, you got the big Q top three in that race and, and you're on your way, uh, I guess back home, um, in Eugene, but not to get, not to get too far ahead of ourselves. Of yeah. course. Um, the, the last question I have is just because it's something that you can't talk to you for an hour plus about without it coming up a lot, which is like your relationship to your family, right? Your two brothers, um, Ryan and Brandon and, obviously your parents who were both competitive track athletes um, at Chapel Hill and then yeah. onward from that. And, you know, you mentioned your dad a lot when you talk about like running or training and really the whole family. And, you know, as someone who's like lived kind of adjacent to the McGordy family for the last five years, <laughs> rooming with Brandon, being teammates with you for a year, um, I've definitely gotten kind of an up close and personal look at the way you guys function, but just, I'd love to hear you kind of describe like your family, what your, what your parents, your siblings like are able to do, kind of for you whether it's on your behalf or kind of working with you because mm-hmm. you had your fair share of adversity and it feels like the type of thing that it's hard to get through alone um yeah. between your family and elise and uh, you know a whole bunch of probably close friends just i'm just kind of giving you an opportunity i guess like just just talk to me about oh you know, yeah i mean like and what they're like incredibly grateful i'm a hundred percent thousand percent blessed to like like you kind of said too because you know, I think the family and Elise is, is the core, but I've been incredibly fortunate just throughout my entire life to have, um, you know, a support system that has been with me through, you know, the highs, but also has been incredibly supportive and, and there for me in the lows. Um, and, you know, there's just been so many different people that have taught me uh, so many different lessons, but um, just, you know, directly on family, um, I think just you know, the, the sacrifice from sacrifices, both my parents have made just, you know, like as they've raised my brothers and I, um, with various sports and kind of just putting what, you know, we were passionate about, um, and making it a priority and always encouraging us and creating an environment, uh, where we weren't afraid to fail, fail and, you know, always feeling supported and and loved with what we were trying to accomplish and, and go after. And, 
um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to be super close with my brothers too. Um, you know, we all kind of ended up finding our way into running. And I think, you know, it's been something that has been able to, you know, bring us closer, um, which, you know, who would have thought that was possible as I was growing up, but you know, they'll, I think without a doubt, Brandon and Ryan are always two of my favorite people to go on a run with. We never take that for granted. Um, especially with just, you know, some of the different adversity we've all had to go through of like when it all lines up that all three of us are able to run together. And, uh, you know, for both my Hagland surgeries, Ryan was actually there to help take care of me when I was first coming back. Um, Brandon was, was there when I was coming back from my foot infection surgery. And I was actually able to be back at home for that one. So my parents were helping me, me out. It's, it's always been a uh, collective um, family effort for, I think all of us. And, um, it's just been, you know, I think it lets you pursue your dreams without fear. Um, and I think that is incredibly empowering and, uh, to be, you know, to feel like with my family, you can pursue your best, um, without like any, any fear and know that you're supported, um, is incredibly freeing and also just powerful um and you know i think it's just all rooted in love and i think like a perfect example is you know that decision to to talk to the sports psych was was not something that like happened right away it kind of took months for me to honestly get to that point um you know it was something that started with through conversations with my family and elise but kind of really manifested itself because i was on a run with brandon and you know he made me promise to him that i would reach out by the end of the year and this run is uh, during Thanksgiving break, so it's November. And uh, in typical me fashion, I didn't send the email to reach out until December 31st, and, <laughs> but got it in. Um, also typical you fashion to still do it, though. Yeah, so I still <laughs> did it, but I just it. waited until the last moment. But basically, when I was talking with the sports psych the first day, he was, um, you know, we were talking about, like, how I'd come to decide to reach out to him, and we were talking through that. And I was talking through the promise that Brandon had uh, had me make with him and you know how that promise um was rooted just purely in love because you know when you love someone you want them to be the best that they can be um and you want the best for them and brandon like making that promise for me was you know him wanting me to go all in on myself and be the best i could be and you know that was just pretty powerful because i hadn't really thought of it from that side and you know it's not like it's anything groundbreaking but i think sometimes when you take a step back and realize um, what the people in your life have done for you and why they're doing the things that they do, I think, um, you know, you can't just help but feel really um, blessed and fortunate. So um, yeah, I know I just kind of got all sappy there on my family, but uh, it's pretty easy to, so I'm uh, yeah. pretty lucky. Yeah. No, it, it takes a village and uh, your family is, is certainly one of the most supportive villages I've seen. And I felt so. like it would have been, discrediting not to talk about it as yeah well. no i appreciate but, you bringing them up so no for sure man um well this this has been this has been an awesome recording i feel like i've learned a lot hopefully everyone uh everyone listening out there has learned a lot as well anything else you want to say before we wrap up totally we talked I for mean, a while yeah no we didn't even get to stanford no it was uh no it was hey, great second episode, to uh, we'll, we'll run it back it was great to talk with you um yeah i feel like you know, the experience has been, you know, it's been really great for me to, to learn from. And I think that, you know, it's not always easy in the moment and there's no like set timeline on when you, when you learn certain lessons, but I do think um, hopefully everyone just through certain types of adversity can kind of learn from it and uh, grow. And I, I do think like, you know, it doesn't, yeah, like I said, it doesn't always happen right away, but I think there can always be lessons to be learned. So but yeah, no, yeah, it's fun. To, yeah. It's fun to talk. You know, it's been a little bit since I've seen you. You catch up. Yeah, uh, we've talked on the phone a little bit when you're talking to Brandon, and we've texted. Yeah, right now, especially about doing a podcast episode. But I'm glad that yeah, that it finally all came together, man. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been a pleasure, and we'll have to have you back. We're gonna have Elise back as well. This, maybe we'll maybe we'll have some sort of couples couples episode as well. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, 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 we'll get get the dirt on you. It can, it can be you, you and Grant, and then me and Elise. We can do couples trivia. <laughs> exactly. That, that's what it might have to be. But Sean, thanks so much for coming on to the Half Step Pod. And thank you all for listening. We will catch you guys next time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Connor.
Yeah. Cheers, guys.